Why do Christians feud? This sweater to look like a little doily. Yeah. <laughs> you would think we're all on the same team, right? He's calling me forward. Think again. I'm going to talk about Stephen Furtick and making sermons about us or about him rather than about the God who inspired it. So why do we fight? And who's right? So why is it that Christians fight? That's what we're going to talk about today. But before we do, I'd like to encourage you to like this video if you don't mind. I'd greatly appreciate it. You can also share it with a friend and subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. You can also visit PastorAJ.com where you can subscribe for my weekly email newsletter or get my latest book, End Times Mission, available in hard copy and on Audible. Now here's an interesting scripture for you in light of our topic. It's Timothy 6.12 and following. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses and the sight of God who gives life to everything and of Christ Jesus who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made the good confession I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ which God will bring about in his own time God the blessed and only ruler the King of Kings and Lord of Lords well, there you have it. We've got God's command to fight. And yet, why do Christians so often fight each other? We see it all the time and even find ourselves in some of our own battles. So why do we do it? And how can we fight in a way that honors God? I actually saw it this week between a prominent Christian podcaster and preacher when Ali Stuckey criticized Stephen Furtick's shirt. Yes, his shirt before launching into a more comprehensive repudiation of his ministry. Let's see what happened. All right. Let's get into Stephen Furtick. Uh -oh. <laughs> There's a lot that we could talk about. Okay, we're going to get to both of the other subjects that we have because they're going to be kind of quick. So I'm going to talk about Stephen Furtick and just comment. I just want to comment on something that he said or part of his sermon waiting from Easter Sunday. It's just important for us to remember what false teaching can sound like and look like. It's not always someone saying something that is blatantly false. It is also a pastor reaching for meaning in scripture that simply does not exist and making sermons about us or about him rather than about the God who inspired it. So, Okay, so you can see that immediately she's going to set the criteria by which she is going to fight. I do think it a little ironic that both the video title and her initial judgment centered around his shirt when it would seem that her true motive was to take beef with his preaching style. So why not title the video Stephen Furtick, Unbiblical Preacher? Here is Stephen Furtick on Easter. And they're standing at a grave, but the angel says, go to Galilee. And they can't stay at the grave because he's not there. Somebody say, he's not in this failure. He's not in, I mean, he's in it to help me, but he's not in it to leave me. I, I do want to say like right off the rip, I mean, this is kind of the way most preachers, when they preach an expository message, they actually find points of application in the text. I mean, that is the point of preaching is to get you to apply God's word to your life so that when you walk away from church, you're living your lifestyle in a way that honors him and demonstrates his character to the world around you. This is part not only of the Great Commission, but it's also part of the cultural mandate all the way back in the beginning, like mankind was supposed to demonstrate God's image in the world. And so true biblical preaching, good biblical preaching, has application to it. So I know where Ali Stuckey's going to go with some of this, but in my mind's eye, a lot of what Stephen Furtick does, and I hate to say it, but he does it a lot better than many Reformed preachers out there, is application helping people to apply God's word to their lives. He's calling me forward to Galilee. As a seminary graduate and somebody who has studied preaching, there was a point many years ago where I was actually leery to even listen to somebody like Stephen Furtick. And as somebody who comes from the Reformed tradition, I could almost hear some of my seminary friends in my mind criticizing what I was about to listen to. But as I listened, I was pleasantly surprised by the expository nature of his sermon, dissecting the scriptures, sticking to just one main passage as opposed to preaching topically, that is, just giving multiple different scripture references and then trying to weave them together into one main point. And I have to say, I was a little impressed. Okay. Can we just like say for a second, Brie, we just comment real fast 
on the sweater. I know it's superficial and it, there's a lot going on here. Much yeah. bigger. Clearly a woman's podcast here, right? Let's be honest. Her issues, but this sweater, which I just, okay. Yeah. Is it salmon? Is it pink? I don't know. Yeah. I'm not sure. I don't know, but it <laughs> was $2,000. Yeah, it was two thousand dollars to look like that. To look like a little doily. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I know that y'all are gonna. Some people aren't gonna be happy that we criticized his fashion. I'm sorry. When you wear a two thousand dollar grandma sweater on Easter <laughs> Sunday and you talk about it, he talks about it in his sermon because he has to. Yeah. Then of course you are inviting people to comment on it. That's why you're wearing it. You could wear it. But are you really inviting people to comment on it? Is is that why you wear something? I mean, is that why Stephen Furtick gets up in the morning to get people talking? I'm not by any stretch a Stephen Furtick apologist, nor do I want to be, but he really doesn't strike me as the kind of guy who wakes up in the morning just to get people talking. And as far as dress in the church, I guess it depends on what kind of church you go to. I personally think people need to get away from thinking that people need to dress or play a certain aesthetic part in a congregation. There was a time in, in many denominations today the clergy and the choir still wear robes. Yet those robes and church liturgy came into fashion at one point. Yes, when you look back in church history, there was a reason for the way people dressed the way that they did. And I think Allie kind of gets to the heart of it here. It's really what it seems like her beef is, is modesty in a church context. What is the difference if someone spends $2,000 on a sweater and a pair of sneakers or $2,000 on a suit? There isn't one. So what do you think about this? Is this fighting fair? These are two Christian people, both of whom's ministries I can appreciate. And they even come from the same Baptist subculture. So why is it that they could openly find themselves at odds like this? And have you ever found yourself in a similar scenario with a brother or sister in Christ? What are the rules by which you engaged him or her? Maybe it was a ministry leader. Gosh, I hope you didn't say anything about what they were wearing. I actually do think it's an important issue to talk about. I do think that a pastor should be understated. I don't even think it has to be cheap, but I do think that whatever a pastor wears should communicate. I don't want you looking at me. This is not about me. This is about the word that is being preached. I do think that when Mike Todd or when Stephen Furtick or when T.D. Jakes are going out there and they are purposely wearing items that say, look at me, I actually think that you are violating God's call to modesty. Because when we see that women and men are called to modesty in scripture, that we are being called to humility. And so in anything that we wear, whether we are deciding how much skin to show or deciding like what kind of brand to wear, things like that, we should be looking at ourselves and saying, what am I communicating? Am I communicating vanity? Am I communicating arrogance? Am I communicating, yes, look at me, think highly of me, be envious of me, or are we simply adorning the temple that God has given us in respect and dignity and humility? Good thoughts, and I think we would all agree with this. She also lumps a bunch of preachers together there. I don't know if you've ever, ever heard of Mike Todd. Certainly he's doing some crazy things in his ministry, and he's taken a lot of flack from the Christian community. And then there's T.D. Jakes, who was recently associated with Puff Daddy and all of his legal issues. But in regard to the way a preacher dresses, assuming that it's not sexual or sensual and a stumbling block to people, I would ask, is it really an issue of modesty or is the thing that you really have a problem with preachers just dressing like the culture so that they can relate with people? Because I actually think that there's something to be said about that in a day and age where we need to make the gospel relatable. In fact, um, isn't that actually the name of her show? And honestly, I hate to say this, so don't be upset at me, but maybe some of these preachers are just doing it better than the next guy. And that's why so many people want to listen to them. In addition to that, I think we need to be careful when we're making a judgment about a person's character and why they are doing something. Is a person dressing a certain way because they want to be flashy? Or are they doing it just because they know how to dress? Or maybe because they want to relate with people? I don't want to be quick to compare anyone in today's day and age to the Apostle Paul, but I can't help and wonder what were some of the things that Paul was criticized for? Because certainly he 
pushed boundaries and broke some of the church culture code of his day in order to win as many as he could to Christ. So what's our motivation? And let's just be careful about judging the motivations of others. So, and you know what? We can't figure out someone's heart. We can't discern, but... I think it's pretty easy to see when someone is intentionally flashy what they are trying and when they talk about it, it, what they are trying to communicate. Okay, so what is my problem with this clip? This clip is from a sermon titled, I'm Somewhere in Between. So this is called, there are a couple of different words for it. This is called eisegesis. We've talked about this before. We actually talked about it with Paul Pitts. Exegesis is when you pull meaning out of scripture, based on what the verses actually say and the context, not just the context of scripture, so the surrounding verses, the entire book and the entirety of scripture, but also the historical context and yes, even the cultural context where it's relevant. You pull meaning out of scripture using these tools, using this kind of contextual understanding. You do the best that you possibly can to pull the meaning out of scripture that is right there. I said Jesus is inserting meaning into scripture. So I want to make a point. I am going to decontextualize a verse and place the meaning that I want to communicate onto that verse. So that is what is going on here. The story of Easter, the story of the tomb rolling away is not about you. It's not about me. It's not about us being in this liminal in-between space and God is taking us to greater heights and making us bigger and better than we were before. Our drab, dreary past is being shaken off as God is promising us riches and success or whatever it is. And I know that I'm kind of paraphrasing here, but that is the message that is being conveyed. The story isn't about us. It is for us. It is not about us. Scripture is not about us. And that is really the theme that you will see in most of Furtick's sermons. Again, making a little bit of a judgment call about the thoughts and intents of a person's heart, ministry, and what she's doing is she's going through what are proper methods of not only biblical interpretation, but what we would call expository preaching. And she actually described it pretty well. Certainly the biblical text is not about us, but I really wonder how far you could even push that statement, because certainly you could say that the biblical text is about God's redemptive plan in human history, i.e. how he saved us and how he saves us. And every expository sermon, at least a good one, has to have good practical application that even the guy sitting on the street corner can understand and put into practice in their lives. I don't know if you ever saw Matt Chandler's sermon at Elevation Church from about 10 years ago or so. If you haven't, see if you can find clips of it online. But he actually went into Elevation Church and preached this same message to the people there. I think his takeaway was, it's not about you or something like that. So this is clearly a knock on many coming from this demographic within the church community, a beef or a fight, I guess you could say, that they have with those who do church like Elevation. But the one criticism I would have for my Reformed brothers and sisters in Christ, and yes, I am a Reformed Christian. I went to a Reformed seminary. Stephen Furtick has a Master's of Divinity. I don't know if you realize that or not. My one criticism of preaching from a Reformed tradition is that it so often focuses on theology, i.e. making it about God, that it misses the practical application part, which is the point of preaching. The point of preaching is hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is the art of looking for meaning in the text to the average person. So oftentimes you hear people looking at good preachers who are giving good expository sermons, and they say, they're not making it enough about God. They're not making it enough about God. Oftentimes they are. We just don't like the way they're doing it. And boy, I hate to go here, but Do you think sometimes in our beef, there's a little bit of jealousy sprinkled on top for somebody who's doing the Christian thing just a little bit better than we are? All stuff you need to consider before you pick up your sword and charge into battle. Is about Jesus. So whenever 
we are expositing scripture, reading scripture, preaching scripture, teaching scripture, understanding scripture, and we are pulling the meaning out of the text, using scripture to interpret scripture, using all the context that we have available, what we know about God as revealed in his word. As we are exit scripture, we are primarily looking to answer the question, what does this reveal about his character? What is God doing in this? That's not the only thing. There are things to be revealed about human nature, about how the world works. And there are certainly principles to apply to repent of. There are misunderstandings that we may need to correct. There are maybe wrongs that need to be righted either in our lives or in our minds. We need to keep our theology in check. So obviously there are things that we take from scripture, but through the lens of this is God's word talking about God. Jesus is the star of the show. This is for me, but this is not about me. The problem when you see preachers start using every story in the Bible, which are real historical stories that really happened as metaphors, for your life, or your trajectory, or your journey. Jesus' resurrection is not a metaphor for you in your life. It, it, it's not. I mean, actually, it is, because when we're baptized, we are taking on Jesus' narrative. In fact, as a Christian, there's one thing we can definitively say. It's that Jesus' narrative is our narrative. We identify with him in his death. We go under the water. In our rebirth, we come up to newness of life like he was raised. And then our Christian walk can be characterized by that same cycle over and over and over again. We fall, we stumble, we die, and we're raised again. All of that symbolic, metaphorical, of the way that we will one day be bodily, physically resurrected the way that Jesus was. You know, and I, I'm thinking about this from a Reformed perspective. I don't know how entrenched in Calvinism Ali Stuckey is, or maybe others of you who are listening out there, maybe some who dislike preachers like Stephen Furtick. But I think about the first question and answer to the Westminster Catechism, that man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. You see, the gospel itself isn't Jesus died and was raised. It's that Jesus died because of our sin. It's the reason Jesus had to die. And she's kind of getting at this a little bit in her explanation because she says there's also this and there's also that. But I think it leaves huge chunks of the story out to say that the Bible is only about God. Certainly Jesus is the star of the story, or better yet, the Trinitarian God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is the star of the story. But the story, the book, is how we come to know him. That was the point of Paul's epistles, how we come to create a world that was lost in the beginning. That's actually Christ's mission for us here. How do we create that community? And yes, Christian, that is your job, is to create a community. It's to be involved in the community around you. How do you do that without seeing yourself in the story and without realizing that Jesus himself bodily existed, performed ministry just like it says in God's holy and perfect word, but that those same actual literal truths have metaphorical meaning for those of us living 2,000 years later. I mean, why else would we read it if this wasn't the case? And a good preacher makes those kind of connections for his flock. So maybe a little bit of a call to not be so much of a hater, just in general, about other preachers or pastors. Fight your fight, but do it in a way that shows the whole picture and that's trying to improve the whole body of Christ. It's real. It actually happened. It reveals to us the power of God. What does it say about God? It means that Jesus conquered death. Okay, from here she launches into her own sermon, and I'll let you go back and watch this whole video if you want to see everything in its context. I've got it linked in the description. But what's your takeaway from one Christian having a public criticism of another and both of them from the same sect? How do we look to the outside world and the church community when we decide to take Paul at his word and fight for our faith. Because at the end of the day, that's what I look at both of these individuals and feel that they're doing. Certainly everybody is open to criticism and that would include Stephen Furtick. But at the end of the day, he's probably just a guy who is passionate 
and fighting in his own way to reach people for Jesus. Whether or not Ali Stuckey's criticisms of him are valid, especially as it pertains to his shirt, is another matter entirely. And what might some of his criticisms be of her ministry? You know, she has a pretty large following last I checked, and I'll bet there's a lot of ladies in his church who watch her podcast. I actually kind of wondered at one point if his wife had seen these clips. And so how do we fight? And how do we fight in a way that glorifies God because as you can see the kingdom of God is a big place it's very diverse and sometimes the mission of God can actually seem like it's competing against itself if we as Christians don't have the bigger picture in mind so how can we do what Paul called us to do because I'm a preacher myself I'm going to give you three practical things you can do right now to help you apply this word to your life. The first is to remember why you are fighting. In other words, check your motives and make sure that they align with what the Bible teaches. How might the two people that we looked at in this video answer that question for themselves? I suspect we might get some very different answers, but I think we also might be surprised by how both of those answers actually align with God's mission in the world. So when we're fighting, and sometimes fighting with another Christian, let's remember why we're fighting, and at least remember to go back and align what we're saying with God's word. Number two, realize that everyone does not have your ministry. As a mentor and pastor friend of mine likes to say, stay in your lane. If you're called to street ministry, don't be so quick to criticize the pastor who's putting a sermon together for his Sunday morning flock. I'm not saying you can't do it. I'm not saying we can't call one another out and even sometimes publicly because the very nature of ministry is public. But when we're able, let's stay in our lane. And if we are part of the same group, then let's try to see how someone else might be reaching people for God in a way that I'm not and that I'm not even capable of or gifted for. This is one of the things that Paul says to Timothy in our opening scripture. He says, I charge you to keep this command. In other words, this gets at the heart of something that we've been communicating throughout this video, and that's the idea that God has a calling for you. He has an application for you. This is how the word of God is living and active. It's one story, but it's got innumerable applications for every believer that has ever existed on the face of the earth. And so what is God's charge to you and how can you be faithful to that charge while also extending grace to other believers whenever possible? And finally, once you've decided the why and the what of your calling, fight. I mean, that's how we started, right? So I'm going to finish it there. Christians are called to fight. It says it in Holy Scripture. Why is it that sometimes we feud? It's because we're supposed to. It's because we're passionate about Jesus. And so when we do it, we ought to do it with a zeal for God's law, for God's character, and most of all, for his kingdom. When you can fight that way, you can't go wrong. God bless you, friends, and I hope you found this video helpful. And like I said when we started, if you did find it helpful, make sure you smash that like button. I would greatly appreciate it. And subscribe to this channel. And I know I say this all the time, but go to PastorAJ.com where you can sign up for my weekly email newsletter to stay connected with me as I help you try to stay connected with God's mission. Peace out, friends, or should I say, go fight, win, in Jesus' name. Later.